Okay, so this is the last uh, lecture, uh, and just like the other modules, there'll be a brief lecture and then an introduction uh, to the hands-on tutorial, and then we'll go through some hands-on exercises, and then if there's some time left, we can uh, go back to the integrated assignments. Uh, so isoform discovery and alternative expression. Um, this is a huge topic, so we're really just going to cover one aspect of it, and that's the the aspect of it that relates to the tool chain that we've been using, which is the top hat cufflinks cuffdiff uh, paradigm. Uh, so the learning objective really of this module is to explore the use uh, of cufflinks in sort of a slightly different mode. So we're going to go back and run cufflinks again with di different parameters that are a little bit more optimized for alternative expression uh, and isoform discovery. Uh, and just to remind ourselves where we're at, so we've been uh, really focused on uh, assembling and quantifying uh, instances of uh, transcripts in our RNA-seq data. Uh, and what we're going to do now is go back uh, and reanalyze the data, uh, but uh, do it in such a way that we're going to be more able to quantify and capture uh, cases where this mRNA gets made multiple different ways. So the depiction here is really simplified. You have a, a, a pre-mRNA transcript with two introns and three exons. Uh, and those introns are removed and the axons are spliced together, and this is being done only one way. Uh, but in a lot of eukaryotic species, there's multiple, multiple isoforms uh, that are made from the same uh, DNA template. Uh, and there's a huge field of people uh, studying alternative splicing, and e even within uh, RNA-seq bioinformatics, uh, there's a lot of people working on tools related to uh, alternative expression analysis. And, this figure is taken from, uh, I believe it was a bioarchive paper, uh, and there was also a blog post about it. I don't, I'm don't. i not aware of this. This paper might have actually been published somewhere since then. We, we should check to see if we can update that. Uh, but they basically did a review of existing tools and methods uh, that use RNA-seq data to study uh, transcript diversity uh, and alternative expression patterns. Uh, this slide is also kind of a reference. Uh, so here's some... Uh, typical uh, uh, questions uh, related to uh, alternative splicing in RNA-seq and sort of interesting discussions that we've noticed that happened on Biostars. Uh, but each of these things generally relates to the, the attempt to understand some of the complexity of alternative transcript generation. Uh, so there's, just to remind ourselves, uh, here's a depiction of some of the different forms of alternative splicing. So in the very simplistic uh, form, you have simple transcription where you have a series of exons, uh, introns are removed, and the exons are spliced together to give us some mature mRNA. Uh, and then there's all these alternate ways that can happen. So in this example, you have it, you're using different transcript uh, start sites or alternative transcript initiation. Uh, so transcription either starts with this exon or it starts with the second exon, and that gives you two transcripts that start at different uh, places. Uh, alternative splicing is sort of the most classic form of alternative expression where you're uh, either including uh, exon 2 or you're skipping exon 2. So again, you get two isoforms that differ in their exon content. Uh, sort of si similar pattern uh, here where you're using uh, alternative donor sites. Uh, so in both resulting isoforms, you have three exons, but uh, one of those exons has different boundaries. So you're getting a longer exon 2 in this case by extending uh, the three prime end of exon 2. Uh, you can have the same thing uh, at the other end of exons, at the, uh, by using alternative acceptor sites, again giving you uh, sometimes dramatically different isoforms, or it can be quite a subtle difference. Uh, and because RNA-seq is really has a, a, a base level resolution, you have the potential to tell the difference between uh, very subtly different uh, alternative isoforms, even though it's quite difficult. Uh, mutually exclusive exons is kind of a special case of exon skipping, where you have two isoforms. Uh, being generated that both have three exons, but uh, two different uh, exon twos are being used. So you get sort of two alternate paths that choose a different second exon. Uh, the entire intron can be retained. So as we've been looking at some data in the IGV screenshots, you're often seeing reads that are aligning within the, the introns. Uh, we have to, oh, interesting. We have to consider sometimes the possibility that the reason we're seeing a lot of uh, reads within an intron is that that intron may actually be retained. Uh, so in this example, you're getting a, an isoform that effectively has a very large exon 2 that combines all of uh, the usual exon 2 and 3 plus the intron. 
uh, in between. Uh, and usually this, this is a way of turning off a gene. So uh, when you in include an intron, it often will trigger nonsense mediated decay. Uh, but sometimes you'll actually get uh, different ORFs resulting from uh, the inclusion of small introns in, in different alternative isoforms. Uh, and then just like alternative transcript initiation, you can also have uh, alternative polyadenylation where you have alternate uh, uh, exons and at the three prime end of the transcript being used, uh, again, giving you uh, RNAs of slightly different lengths. Uh, so over the years, there's been a, a lot of attempt uh, in humans and other species to try to uh, understand some of the transcript diversity uh, that we see in the transcriptome of eukaryotes. And uh, there's been a number of sort of technological advancements over the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so that have really allowed us to do a much better job at this. So this is starting to get a bit out of date, but this figure sort of shows some of the technologies over the years that have been applied. Uh, so starting with, uh, and we can imagine a, a locus where we have uh, some hypothetical, fairly complex combination of isoforms that exist, but we don't know what they are yet. Uh, and they differ in which exons they include or introns that they retain or the boundaries of exons that they use and so forth. Uh, probably what remains still really the gold standard way of investigating this diversity is to, to clone cDNAs and to do full-length sequencing uh, of those clones so you completely resolve the structure of a cDNA and then you can map that sequence, uh, high-quality sequence, back to the reference genome and figure out exactly where the exon intron boundaries are. Yeah? So I'm, so there would be an attempt to try to tell whether there was actually splicing going on there or whether the intron was being retained and you would you can look at the coverage pattern and say okay normally we see you know really high coverage at exon 2 and then there's this intron and the coverage drops away and then the coverage goes up again for intron 3 uh, but then when the intron is retained in some other sample we see sort of an even coverage all the way across from the beginning of exon 1 through the intron uh, into the, or sorry, the beginning of exon 2 through the intron to exon 3, you can use that pattern of coverage to infer that the intron is being retained and not skipped. Uh, and you can also use the, the junction splicing reads to get, try to get a sense of whether the intron is being spliced out or whether it's being retained. Is it a mistaken call that it assumes that there's a new exon in that A lot of things, yeah, it's hard to do. So... It, depending on how clear the pattern is, it might be difficult to, to say exactly what the transcript looks like unless you've actually like really sequenced all the way through it really well. Um, I, I think it's one of the hardest categories in a way to detect exactly what's going on. Um, but you know, if you have, there are definitely cases where you have two axons, and especially usually it's easiest to tell with smaller introns if you really see even coverage all the way across that intron into the surrounding exons, you can get pretty, you know, pretty good evidence that the intron is being retained. Um, um, but yeah, if you really want to know what the structure of a transcript looks like, ideally you would sequence a full-length cDNA uh, or slightly less good but still pretty good is to to amplify, if you have some notion of what the five prime sequence looks like and what the three prime sequence looks like, you can amplify cDNAs based on that, and then you can clone those uh, amplicons uh, and sequence those. Uh, so you're kind of constraining your hypothesis to just looking at what the, the internal structure of an isoform is. Uh, so these these two methods are, are really low throughput, but there were some large scale projects in human and mouse and other species that really tried to catalog a, a, a lot of uh, transcript diversity across quite a few tissue types. Uh, but it's extremely labor intensive. It's very expensive. It takes forever. Uh, EST libraries were kind of the first one of the first attempts to make this a bit more high throughput. So this is where you're still sequencing cDNA clones, but you're generating them on a massive scale, and you're using robots, and then you're just sequencing the ends, and you're really trying to automate this. Uh, and then, so for large uh, large transcripts, you're you're missing out on the sequence in the middle, but you're able to learn quite a lot of structural information by just sequencing in from the ends of 
of cDNAs, uh, and it's quite a bit more high throughput than cDNA, full-length cDNA sequencing is, uh, but not nearly as high throughput as some of the technologies that followed. So uh, there are things like uh, CAGE, SAGE, and GIS, which take an even more focused approach and just sequence the ends of transcripts. They can provide a lot of information about uh, the five prime uh, start sites of transcripts uh, or the three prime polyadenylation sites. Uh, or in the case of GIS, you kind of get both at once, sort of the beginning and end of the transcript, and you don't know much about what's in between, so it tells you a lot about transcript initiation and polyadenylation sites in the genome. Uh, and then really what changed all of this was when uh, sort of RNA-seq came onto the, the scene and you started to have 454, uh, and then Selexa, or now it's called Illumina. So you have really, really high throughput uh, data for sequencing the transcriptome. The reads are small, but you have a massive, massive amount of them, uh, and this allows you to, in one shot, get a huge amount of information about the transcriptome uh, in a single sample. Uh, and this has really uh, sort of revolutionized our ability to, to detect alternative isoforms and to measure their abundance, uh, although it remains a very technically challenging uh, problem. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today a little bit is Cufflink's attempt to look at this. Um, so uh, Cufflinks doesn't, you know, tackle, it doesn't solve all the world's problems, but it kind of breaks, breaks this problem into, into three parts, uh, and that is to look at um, transcription start sites, so that was one of the categories that we looked at, um, and uh, it also looks at the CDS components, so the part that's actually translated, uh, and, uh, sorry, this is transcription start site. Uh, this is the, the coding sequence part of uh, transcripts, and this is uh, the splicing preference within transcripts. Uh, so if you look at the, the color coding here, we have this hypothetical example where we have three transcripts, a blue, a yellow, and a red, uh, and they differ in slightly different ways. So uh, we've got two transcripts here that have the same transcription start site, but one of them skips an exon relative to the other one. So that we've got this exon being included. Uh, in the blue transcript and it's being skipped in the yellow transcript. Uh, and then we've got another set of, tra uh, of transcripts that differ by their transcription start site. So we've got two transcripts here that, ha that use this promoter site uh, and then two transcript or one transcript here that uses a, a different transcript start site. Uh, and then if we look at the CDSs of these, the part that's actually an open reading frame, again we have two. Uh, but in this case, the blue has sort of a long open reading frame, and the yellow and the red share the same short open reading frame. Uh, so Cufflinks tries to basically look at each locus and break the transcripts into these different categories. So it's, it looks at all of the transcripts at a locus and says, what are all of the promoters, the transcription start sites that appear to be in play here? And I'm going to bin the transcripts according to which transcription start site they used. Uh, so in that case, uh, you're going to bin... Uh, a and B together uh, and compare it to C. So because A and B use the same transcription start site and C uses a different one. And then it does the same, same thing with exon inclusion. It says, okay, which of these transcripts uh, includes uh, this exon 2 and which of them skips? So it's going to compare uh, A to B. Uh, and then it says, uh, which of these transcripts have a particular open reading frame and which of them have a, a another open reading frame, and it bins them like that. So it's going to compare uh, A, that has the long open reading frame, to B and C, uh, that have the, the shorter open reading frame, which is shown here. Um, and each of these sort of tests or arms of the analysis uh, is sort of divided into a different output file uh, when you run Cufflink. So you might have noticed in the, the Cufflink's output that you have all of these different output files. Uh, so there's these uh, categories here where, in addition to the sort of gene differential expression analysis, you also get uh, splicing differential expression files, and that's the one that corresponds to these exons being skipped or included. You've got the pro promoters files, uh, which correspond to this comparison of alternate transcript start sites, so TSS1 versus TSS2, uh, and then you've got these CDS files that uh, compare the different uh, transcripts with uh, distinct open reading frames. So really the, the tutorial uh, is going to go back, uh, so we're going to circle back to the, the Cufflinks transcript compilation step and we're going to rerun Cufflinks and Cuffdiff uh, in a slightly different mode 
uh, that's more sort of attuned to detecting uh, these kinds of events. Um, so I think we've already talked about these things, so I'll just skip that. All right, any questions on that before we jump into the last set of slides? Okay, so there's quite a lot of uh, jargon uh, in this section, uh, and one of the first things that we're going to talk about is uh, the different modes of cufflinks, which we refer to as reference-only, reference-guided, and de novo. So you might have noticed as you've been running your, through your cufflinks uh, steps so far that you named the subdirectory uh, ref-only at one point. We're basically going to go back and run very similar analyses and create like very similar output uh, but in two additional uh, sets uh, for uh, reference guided and to de novo modes. Uh, and then we're going to run cuff merge again, uh, and we're going to combine our transcriptomes from multiple cufflinks runs as we've done. Uh, and we did this before. We basically compared our transcripts to known transcripts. Uh, but because we were really like uh, biasing the results towards known transcripts in the first place, we didn't really dig into the the result of that comparison very much because it was sort of expected what would happen. Uh, but now that we're running, going to run cufflinks in more of a sort of de novo or predictive mode, we're going to compare the transcripts that are predicted back to our notion of what the known transcripts for human look like. Uh, and we're going to look at how cufflinks classifies its predicted transcripts against the known transcripts. So it's going to try to bin its predicted transcripts into different categories, such as this transcript that I, that I predicted looks exactly like one that we already know about, uh, and this other transcript that I predicted appears to be novel uh, or different from uh, what we currently know in the transcript dome. Uh, and then we're also going to step back even further and go right to the, the top hat output. Uh, so top hat actually gives you this uh, junctions count file. Um, and this is much more focused on the counts for exon, exon junctions, but it can be quite revealing and useful uh, for detecting alternative splicing patterns as well. Without even having to run cufflinks, you can just really focus in on specific exon skipping events by looking at the read support for each of the exons being connected. Um, that's something that Top Hat spits out at, at the end of, the, uh, of its alignment process. Uh, and then to try to uh, make this a little bit more interpretable, we're going to visualize uh, some of these junction counts and the, the different transcripts that get assembled by cufflinks uh, in IGB. And so we're going to get another opportunity to become uh, even more familiar with IGB as well. So running cufflinks in these different modes, uh, in module th four, or sorry, this should say module three, stupid numbering. Uh, in module three, we ran cufflinks in the ref reference only mode, uh, which basically gave us a, sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between transcripts that we supplied in our transcript GTF file and transcripts that we had abundance estimates from uh, uh, for from cufflinks. Uh, but now we're going to be able to handle or detect potentially uh, novel genes and novel isoforms of known, known genes. Uh, so to accomplish this, we're going to rerun cufflinks in the reference guided and de novo modes. In the ref guided mode, we're still going to use a, a known transcriptome, but we're going to tell cufflinks uh, to just use this as a guide and still try to predict novel transcripts. And then in the, the de novo mode, we're going to run cufflinks without a GTF at all. So cufflinks will just be given the RNA seq data with no prior knowledge about what exons are expected and what their connections are. And the way this is all handled is by using different. Uh, parameters when we run cufflinks and they all have this very confusing naming uh, strategy. Uh, so there's a bunch of options that use a, either a small g or a big g uh, and it's really easy to get them all mixed up. Uh, so this is just a description of what they are that's kind of a, a, a reference. Uh, so you have uh, a big g that's used when you're actually doing the alignment. So top hat itself has a, a an option to supply a GTF file, and we did this. So we, when we were running our alignments, we supplied a GTF file to Top Hat, and it used that file to 
build a database of transcript sequences uh, and to build a database of junction junction connections and it used that to help the alignment. Um, it's not trying to predict isoforms, it's just trying to align reads against the transcriptome and the genome uh, and this is how we tell it what the transcriptome is. So it's purely to do with alignment. Uh, and then top hat also has a small g option uh, which has nothing to do with uh, splicing really, uh, and that's used to tell top hat the maximum number uh, of multiple mappings for a single read. So it's sort of a tangential issue uh, as to when you have a read that maps equally well to two or three or five or ten places. Uh, this option basically says, you know, when do I stop making note of those? If this read, and I think the default is 20 or 40, uh, so it'll report uh, multiple equally good alignments, uh, and then once it gets to this whatever number you put here, or the default if you don't specify, then it'll stop reporting uh, all of the alignments for that, uh, that read that maps all over the place. Okay, so we're not talking about, we're not really going to be dealing with those. Um, what we are going to be doing is uh, changing the, the G options for cufflink. So it has a big G option, and this is what we use to supply a transcriptome GTF file. Uh, and this is basically how we triggered the, the reference only mode that we ran in module three. Uh, it also has a small g option. Uh, again, you use it to supply the same uh, transcriptome GTF file, uh, but this time it's uh, you when you say, use the small g, you're telling cufflinks to use uh, the, this GTF just as a guide uh, instead of as in the reference only mode. Uh, and then if you don't specify either the big g or the little g, so you don't give it a GTF file at all, then that's what we're going to call the the novo analysis mode. And then cufdiff. Uh, also requires a GTF file, uh, and then just to make it even more confusing, uh, they decided to specify this GTF file without using a big G or a little g. It just you put it in a certain order when you're creating the command. Uh, so even though these were all developed in the same lab, it, this is a sort of remarkably obtuse way of, of laying things out. Um, one thing you can do to, to sort of make it a little bit easier is to each of these options has sort of a long version. Uh, so you can spell out the long version, then it, it becomes a little bit less confusing. And in the online, uh, or the, the hands-on tutorial, we try to use the, the long version to, that are a little bit more descriptive and not quite so confusing. Okay, and then the, the, cho the top hat junctions bed file. So this is really a much more focused and, and simplistic way uh, of looking at splicing data, uh, but it can be quite revealing uh, nevertheless. So. Right after we uh, alignment, top hat creates this summary of all of the reads that spanned across exon exon junctions. So these are not read pairs that span across different parts of the transcript, but individual reads where part of the read aligned to the edge of an exon, and then the alignment for the rest of that read continued on uh, in the next exon, and there's an intron in between. Um, that's called a junction read. Uh, and at the end uh, of doing its alignment, top hat produces this bed file where it basically goes through and it says, find all of the unique instances where there appears to be a read spanning across an intron uh, that connects two exons uh, and build that unique list and then give me the count for the number of reads that span spanned across each of those unique junctions. So you get this output where it just names these junctions arbitrarily, one, two, three, four, uh, and so on, and you'll often get tens of thousands, uh, if not a few hundred thousand uh, in your transcript dome. Uh, and then it just gives you the count. So it says, okay, I, I saw this junction, and there were three reads for that X on X on connection. And there was five reads for this one, six reads for that one, three reads for that one, and so on. Uh, and we're going to visualize the, that output uh, in IGB uh, by loading uh, this junctions bed file. And then we're also going to experiment with a, a plugin for IGB that's called Sashimi, uh, that, which helps you produce like really nice visualizations of splicing patterns. Um, right from IGB. Uh, and the first, uh, the first of those things is, is shown here. Uh, so we have this junctions bed file that's been loaded into IGB just like we would load a BAM file or we can load GTF files. You have lots of different files that you can visualize in IGB. Uh, and what we're showing here is a, a junction file from one of our data sets uh, and it's being compared against the known transcript. Uh, and each of these red arcs uh, corresponds to one of those junctions in the previous bed file and the, the sort of strength or darkness of the arc is proportional to the read count. So how many reads supported 
uh, each of these junctions. And we're going to load one of these files along with the BAM file, and then you'll be able to see, okay, here's the reads that seem to span across these junctions, uh, and then here's the summary of the number of those reads uh, that were identified for each of those unique junctions. Uh, and this is actually a case where you can, you can demonstrate the sort of potential for uh, alternative splicing analysis just by thinking about these junctions. So uh, we have our gene model here uh, with all of our little exons that are uh, the sort of higher uh, boxes connected by the, the sort of intron lines. Uh, and the junctions actually indicate um, a novel exon that might be expressed. Uh, so there might be a, a novel isoform that contains an exon that isn't part of this gene model. Can you, can you guys see where that is in those junction arcs? Does anyone, does anyone want to point it out? The little one beside. You mean this this medium sized thing and that one? Yeah, there's like a little red thing indicating that there must be a junction somewhere with a turn exon. Right, exactly. Um, uh, they're just split that way so that they're not piling up on top of each other. Um, those are not re like, related to each other because this is not the same one. Not necessarily. They're just so they're just being. That's a good question. Um, so they're just being spaced on onto three lines here so that they're not piling up on on top of each other. But the where which of these three uh, spots they're put in is kind of arbitrary, and they're just put that way to sort of so that they're not piling on top of each other. And actually, this is the expanded view. So you know how in IGB there's a lot of this expanded, collapsed, squished, different views. Uh, the default will often be the, the collapsed view where they all they are all just piling up on top of each other. And when you look at them alongside a gene model like this, it's really tempting to think, oh, they must all be connected because they line up so beautifully with this known transcript. And they all seem to be in order. Uh, and they probably do come from that transcript, but you don't actually know that for sure. It's, it's an inference based on how they correspond. Uh, but yeah, there looks like, uh, there looks to be uh, a novel exon here. So most of these arcs are really lining up with the edges uh, of known exons here. Uh, and we have one that's lining up here and it's connecting all the way over there. But then we have these two arcs that seem to be going uh, over here. So there's this one that goes from the edge of that exon into this space here where we don't have a known exon. Uh, and then there's this one that's coming from the exon over there and it's coming over here somewhere. Also no, no known exon. Uh, and presumably those two things are coming to the left and to the right side of an unannotated exon that was not known to. Uh, I guess this is probably the RefSeq gene track. Okay, so cuff merge, we're going to run cuff merge again. Um, and as before, it's going to combine transcripts from multiple uh, data sets into a single unified sort of union view of the transcriptome. We're going to do this before running cuff diff. Uh, and then at the same time, we're going to supply it with a GTF file of our known transcripts so that it compares all of our predicted transcripts back to the, the known transcriptome. And we'll take a quick look at this file uh, and it's going to assign a code to each of these predicted transcripts that tells you something about how novel or known that transcript is uh, and the description of those class codes can be found in the, the Cufflinks manual. It looks like these, these, are, these links all need to be updated as well. Um, the manual has changed locations. Uh, and then we're going to load some of these things into IGB and just do some comparisons of the GTFs from the, each of the cufflinks modes. Uh, and what I'm, so what I'm showing here is just an example where we had a reference-only mode uh, that summarized these three transcripts that uh, presumably correspond to known ensemble transcripts. Uh, and then in the ref guide in the NOAA mode, we're getting a prediction of something being uh, transcribed uh, from this region that doesn't correspond to an ensemble transcript. Uh, and here's just uh, another uh, example, again, of the sort of complexity of some of the, this output. Uh, so in this case, we had the reference-only mode, and we had one known transcript. So we got basically one uh, abundance estimate and one transcript uh, assembly for the, the reference transcript. Uh, and then in the novel mode, we get all kinds of stuff. So this sort of speaks to that, the comment about intron retention, where we have 
a, a small intron retention being predicted here, uh, presumably because cufflinks saw, okay, there's a, a real spread of coverage across this intron that seems like it might be connecting these two exons. So maybe this exon actually consists of the, the regular edges of these two exons plus the intron being retained. Uh, and we're seeing different uh, three prime ends uh, and exons being skipped or included. They were getting mapped. So uh, we're not we're not going to change the alignments. So it, yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? Like the, we're fundamentally dealing with the same reads mapped in the same ways to the same places. We're basically just interpreting those those alignments in increasingly speculative ways. So in the in the way that we already did, we were basically saying. You know, try to interpret all of these reads in the context of exon uh, transcript structures that we already know about. And so, in that scenario, a lot of these reads that map within introns uh, or in spaces where there's no known transcript are just basically ignored. They're sort of put it put aside and sort of like they don't contribute to any of the the abundance estimates because they don't map up match up with one of our prior expectations about a transcript. Uh, in the de novo mode, it t it's it's much more of an attempt to um, explain every read by a transcript, uh, and the, there's a compromise there that means you know it, it's kind of satisfying in a sense to say, well, if we have all these RNA seq reads, they're they're all supposed to be resulting from transcription events, so let's try to uh, assign each of them to a predicted transcription event. Uh, but doing that, it becomes much noisier, so you wind up with a lot of spurious. Uh, likely false positive transcript structures. Um, and I, I think the reference guided mode is kind of a compromise between those two extremes. And the, the data set that we use is so kind of optimized for the tutorial and massage that the difference is actually quite subtle, uh, which is a bit misleading um, if you just if you hadn't sort of purified the data for things that align quickly, you would get a much bigger difference between the reference only, uh, and the de novo mode. And it, the de novo mode tends to be quite wild. Like you get large numbers of transcripts being predicted for e almost every locus, and a lot of them are probably not real. They're just, there was just enough noise in that one intron that it thought, okay, maybe there's a transcript that includes that intron. I'm going to take a guess that that's what happened. Um, and transcription is just so noisy that you wind up with a lot of noise predictions. Um, but you also have the potential to discover a novel transcript or a novel gene. And it, it, it's what the authors recommend, um, but you never quite know. I mean, they're obviously very proud of this aspect of the analysis, so I think a, a lot of people have been a little bit more skeptical about um, how noisy it is. And it's just a really hard problem. There's no way around it. Yeah? For the analysis we already Yeah, they wouldn't no, wouldn't really be. Yeah. Then you are probably underestimating because yeah. You might be underestimating the total transcriptional output from, from a locus yeah. because you're making an assumption that maybe that the that the transcriptional like the transcript diversity from that locus is really as simple as what you claim it to be in your GTF file. So if you're, if the annotations in your GTF file are an oversimplification, then you will tend to yeah, fail to account for reads that really do belong to a transcript from that locus, which means you will tend to underestimate uh, the, the overall expression output from that locus. Um, so the flip side of that is that you, if you start predicting all kinds of different transcripts, you're, you're, tr you're kind of dividing up the abundance amongst more things. You're saying, oh, and now I, I believe that the cufflinks is saying, now I believe there are tr 10 transcripts here, um, but each of them is an independent thing, so I can only distribute the total expression output amongst them, so that tends to bring down the abundance of each of them individually. And 
if some of them were just false predictions, then you're kind of spreading around the expression output to things that aren't real. And so you're, you may be underestimating the abundance of a real transcript in order to, to give some weight to a transcript that's false. So you would definitely not want to be like comparing the output from cufflinks in, in one mode for one sample to the uh, output from cufflinks in a different mode in a, for a different sample. So like whatever you do, you want to do it consistently across your samples. So when our automated <laughs> pipeline at uh, MGI, we run all three of these modes automatically uh, and sort of for the first pass, I just want to know is EGFR expressed kind of thing, we use the reference only because it tends to be robust to the kind of noisiness of various mad predictions that Cufflinks makes. But then we have the other two more sort of speculative and exploratory results on hand uh, if we want to go and look to see whether there's some interesting splicing event going on or whether there's a novel gene or whatever. Okay, and then I think we've already talked about this. Um, what do you do when you can't get this to work on your own data? So quite a few of you have been playing around with either uh, other example data in the integrated assignments, or in a few cases even your own data, which has been you know really impressive. Um, uh, in some cases, you probably maybe don't have the data on hand, or you weren't able to get a downsampled version of it, or that was practical to put on a laptop. So inevitably, you're going to go back and try to uh, you know apply this. Uh, to your own data, and there'll be some hiccups, uh, and so there's a number of you know avenues to pursue. Uh, obviously, review all of the materials in this course for for clues as to what might be going wrong. Um, there is this really nice uh, Nature Protocols tutorial that the authors uh, of Cufflinks uh, wrote. So it's sort of an alternative story to the one that we tell here, but that's very very similar. Um, Biostar seek answers in Google, of course. Um, and definitely BioStars it to ask any questions that you haven't asked and if you, you know, if you don't really hear back or you really think that your question is important and it hasn't been answered then you, know, you can reach out to us and we'll, we'll try to uh, do our best to, to find time for that. Um, and then so the, actually the motivation for creating that, that table, the question answer table that I showed you uh, that will be, uh, that's already available on the wiki, that's part of the, the manuscript. Uh, was really a response to this. The, the Cufflinks offers, authors produced this table of things that might go wrong. Uh, it's a troubleshooting table for, for Cufflinks, and they have this comically short list of only four things that they could imagine going wrong, which are like drawn seemingly randomly from the probably 100 things that we've seen go wrong. Um, so the, yeah, the materials that we provide are attempt to try to you know, flesh this out a bit more and catch more of the, the edge cases, uh, things that sort of typically uh, cause you to run amok. Uh, 